Well. That's all right. Good to go. Hmm? That was good. Mm. Yeah, it was. That's it. Just keeping us on our toes. A lot of them were in the mutual studies like the level five with us and now they're children. So many people say I'm putting them from the Okay, actually, can I just, you know, Jeremy, can I ask you to 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 ask <laughs> you don't, you know, honestly, whatever, if you feel comfortable. Say again? <laughs> I think this is very much needed. It was just an idea. <laughs> Yeah, I'm I'm ready. Whenever's Oh I'm on YouTube. Hi YouTube. Hello YouTube. Hi everyone, um, just a very quick introduction for me because you would have noticed if you looked at the Culture Maneuvers student team that intro Jeremy does as an artist, video, performance, and also he's created his own artist space as well, which he might talk about a bit later. Um, you've been given two links to look at on the Culture Maneuvers teams as part of this interactive session today. So when Jeremy says, please go to link Please link into Teams and go to Student Culture Maneuvers where you'll find the links. Over to Jeremy. Thank you. Can everyone hear me all right? Is this loud enough? Great. I feel a little bit penned in here. So uh, I might walk around a bit, hopefully not too much like a TED talk. Uh, that. So thanks for having me. And it's nice to be here. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about my practice, but also we'll do sort of a workshop. I don't just want to stand here and tell you about me. I want this to kind of be a session where you get something useful that might inflect on how, like tools that I use in my practice that might be of service to you. So hopefully that'll 
That'll be helpful. Because I think, you know, studying, I teach at uh, UAL. Uh, boo. <laughs> a bit, not at the moment, so I'm like, and a bit at Goldsmiths, boo. And I visit uh, various places. And I'm just really interested by uh, education and what it means at the moment. Like, I'd be curious to hear, like, what you want from your course. Like, what is, what's your ambition? Like, beyond this. Anyone put up your hand and say, I mean, get a job, maybe? Um, you know, and maybe be famous? Be inspired? Be creatively fulfilled? Um, and sometimes, like, OK, I'm not going to put anyone on the spot. <laughs> you, what do you want? You know, how can we make the most of the position that we find ourselves in, which is essentially a ready-made? The world is a ready-made, and we come into it, you know, as babies, and we have to, like, adapt to it and adapt it. Like, it's not like some sort of blank canvas. Um, and I'm really interested in the way that you can operate, like how you can move into the world and sort of mess with its rules. That, for me, is what, big word, but like freedom looks like. Something that is like sort of messing around so that, because the world is full of its rules, its codes, its sort of social norms, behavior, language, you know, like all of that. So we, we kind of move into a world, we learn language from our parents, but so we need to sort of behave within the limits, but how can, I had to leave my, my wife, my thing on because uh, I'm using my hotspot. So hopefully my phone won't ring and that won't happen the whole time, but there it is. If it does, it does. How can we operate inside of the structures that we're inside of? and use them and, and manipulate them just to our own like our own advantage so in many ways this that's my practice is kind of about power i mean clearly i'm a white english man so i'm speaking from relative position acknowledging that position but even still my own life is subject to sort of you know power constructions that i don't have any control of so it's kind of like engaging with inserting myself in and sort of messing with the codes of power structures. Now, what was I going to say? I guess in the process of doing that, what I'm interested in is like how those norms, those codes, that logic is like all stuff that is, tells you what's right and what's wrong. This is good. This is correct. That is, then you'll get the job if you do that. And if you do more of that, you'll get a better job. Which sort of works to an extent. And like, if you want to work in design or fashion, advertising, photography, I don't know, art, it, they have their own rules. And they say, well, just follow these, you know, and that will guarantee you success. Which is often like, and increasingly so, kind of like a false promise because a, those are the ways things have been. And so if you just do that, then you're not going to sort of innovate. But B, you're just kind of continually subjecting yourself to the demands of other people. So, you know, for all of us, the task is like, how do I like sort of know the limits, know the rules, but also kind of mess with them? Like, because, I mean, well, firstly, cultural maneuvers. Turns out there's not really a standard way of writing that word in the first place, because I wrote it the other way, and then I saw Pauline, she had put an O in it, and I was like, oh, shit, did I spell it wrong? And it turns out, no, because, you know, words are just sort of arbitrarily decided on and then written by people in dictionary rooms and stuff, and then it becomes the word. So there it is. I felt that was sort of appropriate. And this billboard, which is uh, some stolen picture from Google, like, I don't know about you, I really don't know if that's intentional or unintentional as a piece of communication, but there's something about it which I think is far more like effective than if it was the other way around. Like, we're, we're, we're sort of biologically encoded, neurologically encoded to 
to sort of pay attention when things aren't quite right or when they're sort of like unfamiliar at least because we are attuned to spot danger. That's the sort of animals that we are. And so when we kind of go, oh, crumbs, that's a body rearranged, like just on a very unconscious level, we're, you know, we're subjected to tens of thousands of media messages every day. That one might, might cut through. And so I find that quite sort of interesting. Oh, yes, that is a white man, David Ogilvy, uh, who uh, uh, Ogilvy and May, there was is a big ad agency, but this is something he said in the 50s, which, which sort of, to an extent, remains true today. Consumers don't think how they feel, they don't say what they think, and they don't do what they say. Like, I guess, like, I don't like to appropriate sort of quotes from sort of tycoons of 50s advertising, but all the same, there's something sort of interesting about non-rational thinking. Like, how, how, if someone asks you, like, why did you buy that ice cream, you'll kind of use the front of your, you know, or that washing powder or whatever, this would be, like, the part of your brain that you might engage to answer that question. But actually, the reason that you were in the shopping aisle buying the thing is possibly, like, way more all of this stuff, the amygdala and all the kind of emotional, like, unconscious like well, I don't know I just sort of felt like it and you know maybe some jingle <laughs> or some something sort of powerful something like something had arrested me maybe in the product design maybe in the I don't know, the ad or something that had kind of caused me to sort of like that had just set a new like emotional rather than sort of rational relationship with that thing um, I'm using examples because, well, firstly, I, I'm not sure where you guys are all headed, but you might be going into more sort of commercial disciplines or going into more artistic ones. But actually, my personal interest isn't like, oh, well, that's where it ends and all this is art and all that sort of fake kind of consumer capitalist stuff. My interest is in the whole wash of stuff. Like, we are in a sort of massive cultural miasma where everything's feeding, you know, into the other thing. So I, I personally don't really draw a distinction uh, between the two. Uh, errors and, and that's my daughter wearing uh, cornflakes on her head. The point of that is like that uh, cornflakes, for example, was developed in uh, 1860 something. And Mr. Cornflakes is uh, Kellogg's brother. He left some corn on the boil and it sort of like was, you know, got all flaky and weird and mushy. And that was the advent of cornflakes. There are enumerate, as we all know, like examples of like penicillin, uh, Kodak, uh, 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 microwaves, like uh, post-it notes. Like the post-it note guy who invented post-it notes, he was trying to invent a piece of paper that would stick to a wall and he could never do it. <laughs> it just kept on falling off or just not being very strong, sticky stuff. And it was his female assistant who said, do you know what, I think it's kind of useful. Like that could be quite, quite good, you just put it on. Examples is there isn't like a right way of things, no like you know motor way of sort of correctness, and then it's just like what we lend meaning to, what we what we decide can be ascribed cultural or economic social value. Um, and what's funny about the idea of right of things being right is that pretty limited like and it changes all the time like in our cultural construction you know this is right and and then in 2022 this will be right and it will just carry on being like but there is an infinitude of wrong stuff out there like never ending carries on forever being like wrong <laughs> which for us I think is an opportunity like because what we can do is say okay here is the assortment of stuff that I was born into in the world I can choose this kind of organization of stuff. This is all a bit abstract, clearly. But I can decide that that might be a new kind of right. And that is what I think that making art, or actually any form of communication is about, is like, is like assigning value to something that maybe wasn't thought about before. Bringing something in the world that wasn't there before, or might have just been sort of like overlooked. So, you know, Mr. Cornflakes, might easily have just sort of 
said, gross, chucked it in the bin, and that would have been like obliterated breakfast forever, you know? But <laughs> in that moment, he brought like, I don't know, art brain or some sort of presence, some zen-like kind of like, hmm, you know? And that's the moment where you just go, hmm, you just notice. If that's the moment where you just see something and you go, there might be something there, which um, I think we can all... Wolfgang Tillmans, do people know Wolfgang Tillmans? Yeah, he, the photographer, German guy, won the Turner Prize, shot lots of rave culture in the 90s. He came to art school when I was there, and he said something super valuable which of the two hours. This is the only bit I remember. He said, notice the leaves in the wind. And what he meant is, notice when you've thought of something tiny, the tiniest thing that you're like, hmm. And then you're like, hmm, whatever. Because that, that is the thing. That's where everything, as we know, like the big ideas come from that. The cornflake kind of like, hmm, is that leaf in the wind? So that's the moment when you're like, mm, not sure, question mark, probably a bit crap, weird, rubbish idea. It's like honoring, honoring what you notice. Because I think in that moment, you're like thinking slightly out, you can be, not necessarily, like, but you can be thinking just outside the, 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 the tram lines of rationality, like operating just in a space of like, hmm, you know, where your right brain might be going into somewhere that feels a bit weird and dangerous or just, or not very valuable, you know? After, I don't know about you, but after, for me, after the fact, once I've like had developed a project, I look back on my work and I'm like, oh, yes, I had this brilliant idea. I knew it was brilliant from the word go, but it's never the way it works. At the beginning, you're like, oh, it feels a bit shaky. So it's about like going, honoring that tiny leaf, just like, you know, a bit hot. So. Hmm. I can either, can I ask who saw, I did, a, I did a talk in the summer online, who saw that one, anyone, hello, brilliant, so no one else, all right, what's the time, uh, wrong stuff, I'm just going to talk about, I'm going to keep rattling on. Um, I read an article when I was at art school about, it was in the Independent, it was about a factory, the Foxconn factory in Shenzhen where they make iPads and iPhones, and one of the workers to anonymously told the Independent that sometimes he or she would accidentally drop a spanner when they were working on the production line, so that just so they could bend down and pick it up. So they created an intentional error just to create a moment of like freedom or rest, should we say, in the relentless intensity of the production line from people like me but wanting iPhones. And there's something incredibly powerful about that image, the idea that you might make an deliberate mistake so that you could have a moment of just yourself in a world governed by others. Incidentally, people were throwing themselves off the roof of this factory. Um, employment of Foxconn, which is pretty, pretty crazy. Uh, it says a lot about the living conditions. Uh, people there, they actually erected nets to catch people who are jumping, jumping off the building. So this ti tiny detail, and I, I don't know about you, but I look for little details uh, often. They're, they're often the, the beginning of, of, of something. But I became interested by the idea of, well, what if I, Western, I do factories and ask them and say, Dear sir, madam, I'd like to order one of the products made at your factory. I'll have special requirements. I want this product to be made with an error. 
the error must make it impossible to use the product for its ordinary purpose. Some sort of thing with an error that made it dysfunctional. And I wanted the factory worker to choose what the error was. It was his or her decision, and I would accept anything that they chose to make. So I sent that email off to about 5,000 factories and got lots confused responses. Your email has many words, errors, yes, mistakes. Uh, I want the bicycle to be impossible to ride when trying to get a bike. So you're not going to buy it. Yes, I am going to buy it. Don't worry, I'm going to place an order, but this is special. And now I'm really confused. Special. Oh dear. Yes, special bicycles. So lots of difficult... Oh, there was a spade on the left. Although this... Actually, no, that spade was never sent because his manager said, no, we can't send that spade out, that's wrong, and then they got into a bit of a shit fight, so then that never arrived. Uh, it sort of rose, like, what is when you, when you sort of move one thing, it opens up other things that you really don't think about. So Cherry's kind of asking quite sort of philosophical questions, like, so you want us to make a metal coat hanger that you can't hang clothes from, right? So... A coat hanger you can hang clothes from, but it's, you can't hang clothes off this. And she said, it can be anything else, which is not a coat hanger, which is perfectly true. Like, lots of things you can't hang. I mean, that TV, you could hang a... So you could call that uh, a coat hanger. Chair, microphone stand. Things have properties that we don't ordinarily designate onto them. There's a lot in that question. There's also no such thing as a dysfunctional object. If you go to a desert island with a, with a dysfunctional coat hanger, there's an awful lot of things you'll find to do with that. So things are just things, and then we give them meaning and names and stuff. Anyway, and then, uh, <laughs> then Li Ming, uh, this, I started to get like, uh, letters back, and it was like, ah, like eventually, went, and because that's really what, what it came down to because mostly these people would have minimum order quantities of 10,000 according to a given design or if you didn't want their design you tell them the design and I always wanted one and I wanted it wrong and I wouldn't tell them how to make it so I had to make friends and so Ella and I had lots of communication eventually she sent me this email about Li Ming who asked me to say thank you uh, he enjoyed the process the chair is strong enough the first time he wanted to destroy it by a big stone but he failed so then used a cutting machine. The feed is great, he said, after he cut the chair piece to piece. So eventually I got a cardboard box with a sawn up uh, Louis Tours ghost chair, knockoff Philippe Stark plastic, you know. And other things started to arrive, like high heels. And uh, I mean, they're not high heels, they're just like objects now at this point. Um, And from something like 15 different countries. Now, when I showed them, they were accompanied by around Mr. Bikash. This is from uh, Kolkata. And what was nice is that when Manoj, my the person I was communicating with, went to the factory floor and said, "Listen, I, you need to make a dysfunctional cone." Clearly, everyone's going to. Yeah. So it sort of inverts the power relations on the production line. Like, you set out with, like, a mm, wonder. I think taking your work into the world is, is sort of interesting. It's more interesting than the stuff I would just think about and do in my studio on my own. Um, this came from Istanbul. Um, and so the work was uh, displayed on these factory Dexian workbenches alongside all the, the packaging and the correspondence, and then the little book I made. So that the, uh, the entire process, if you like, was sort of available. Um, but I guess the point, the point of the sort of what I want to talk about today is like the, the way that it came about was, was, was through a sort of, well, quite a rigid construction. Now, like the letter functioned, if you like, as a brief, as a sort of a, a, a code. Like, it's on a piece of A4 paper with Helvetica and, like, fairly straightforward. But the, and so it's already using a cultural form that is recognized. 
And I've just reshuffled, like, essentially two elements. One is I want the production line worker to be the source of uh, the, 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 the creative idea, which isn't ordinarily the case. And secondly, I want something that isn't ordinarily used for its intended purpose. So it's just like two things kind of. At, and so, but for me, beyond me and my little world and my art projects, I think, I think what I find helpful to think about is like, I like having fun and I like feeling like, in, like free that anything can happen. But for that freedom, for me, for that freedom to happen, I need like the rules of the game. I need it, I need, eventually I, I make like rule-based games in my practice. So I need to know like, what are the rules? <clears throat> and what I find helpful is to have something like a brief. Um, here's another project uh, which I did around the same time, uh, milk insertion. I wrote myself a little brief. I was like, okay, what am I doing? What am I doing? I was in the West Bank in, in, uh, in, in Palestine. Um, and I was trying to sort of think, you know, on this residency, how to sort of operate. And I started writing these briefs because they would just be like, okay, this place is really complicated and I'm trying to make work. So I'm going to just p sort of pin down what I'm, my attempt is in, in the form of like what we might call a brief. Medium performance, form, HD video, requirements, a little camera and a carton of milk. What am I doing? Why am I doing it? And like, what should I think about? What was I doing? I decided, somebody told me that it was legal for Israeli milk sold in Palestine, but illegal for Palestinian milk to be sold in Israel, which I found an interesting description of the asymmetries of the two kind of pseudo coexisting nations. So I was interested in what would happen if you tried to sell Palestinian milk or tried to buy it uh, from Israeli supermarkets, tried to sort of push against that asymmetry, like, take Palestinian milk to Israel, put it in supermarkets, try and buy it, see what will happen. Why am I doing this? Well, according to the 93 Oslo Accords, which is like a peace agreement, Israeli milk can be sold in Palestine, Palestinian milk cannot be sold in Israel. I want to explore how the politics of the Middle East hinge around a simple carton of milk. How something like milk, which is a sort of image cultural, culturally almost the world over, an image of sort of benign motherhood, sort of... Mm, mm, Nurturing, something like it's just white and pure and simple, you know? And how, how that, even, in, in, even that in, in, in this charged context could be, could be, um, could become sort of, how could be filled with all of the like cultural meaning of what's going on in that place. Play the role of the British tourist, dress accordingly. So like dress in sort of silly shorts and just look like, not silly shorts, just look like a tourist basically. Notice the sound quality, stay back, like think about like what are the, because what am I trying to do? I'm going to go into supermarkets, I'm going to have a camera around my neck, put milk on the conveyor belt and then see what happens. So I'm going to have to like frame the thing, like with a camera around your neck because you're a tourist, you can just kind of like look like a tourist, but while it's filming, ask questions, let the situation play out. Just a set of like governing principles that allowed me to go, I mean, true, like my heart was in my chest doing this, but as long as I know what the rules of the game are, I'll just, I'll just get on and do it kind of thing. So I'll show you a one minute clip. I did this in lots of supermarkets all over uh, Jerusalem. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
Uh, so you get the idea. It was, um, it's like a, it's a sort of simple enough conceit. Explore what would happen if, dot, 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 and then just let it sort of play out. And I don't mean that in a way like I don't have any responsibility, because I do. Like, I know what I'm doing, and um, no lives are lost, but all the same, it's like messing with, some pretty unwieldy political stuff. But I think, like, um, to my mind, um, it was, for what I was intending and my political stance, it was valuable and justified. I did that in, like, 10 or 15 different supermarkets. Clearly didn't, you know, not every time it worked. But what was interesting was to see how, like, different contexts, like, different things happen. Like, in a big supermarket, it's like, all right, security threat. In a small mom-and-pop shop, they're like, weird, uh, yeah, sure, I'll say like that, because, you know, <laughs> I don't know, and then, like, uh, because obviously they have a different economic thing going on. Um, I guess what I'm trying to say is that it's really helpful to have a set, for, to, for me, like, a set of codes, like, a set of, like, a title, a working title, a medium form, requirements, what am I doing? Why am I doing it? Considerations. Like, it's just something that I started doing so that I could kind of give myself a frame, a governing framework. So what do I want you guys to do? Oh, you don't have laptops. Hmm. You do have laptops. I was wondering if you would uh, open your laptops. Think about a project that you are doing now, or you can do one that you have done. And just like use that as a template and spend, should we say, six minutes? Just sort of, I think it's possibly more helpful than me just ranting and saying this is what I do. If you actually have a go at like putting one of your projects into a format like that, you can see how it might feel, how it might be to sort of um, take all of the thoughts and try and condense them into something really simple. So have a go at that, and um, I'll give you. So I'll give you. But look, if you have a notebook, you can do it in a notebook as well. Although we will be doing a laptop thing after this. So for now, do. For now, for this exercise. Just do it on, excuse me, pen and paper if that's what you got. But we're going to do something in a minute, which is um, laptopy. Any questions, or is this easy? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, well, for me, like, that is just my language for me. So, good question. When you were doing the Palestine thing, what did you say before? Let's have a look. You know, this is my language.
company Palestinian milk I just took it from Palestine and, and tried to buy it in in Israel in Jerusalem hello I, that's a really good question. Uh, time's up. Uh, uh, yeah, there were a couple of shops that were like, hold on, it's, it's warm. Why is it warm? This must be. And I was never, you know, because I was, I was walking around Jerusalem, which is hot, you know, at this, that time of year anyway. And, um, and um, interestingly, it was very rare that I was... Uh, I was I was assumed to be the kind of author of that thing. Normally, I was just sort of an invisible, idiotic tourist. And I think the I don't know, like playing that playing that role is something that I've explored a bit. Does anyone want to share theirs? How they what they came up with? You don't have to. Yeah, share your brief. Let's hear. Yeah.
Say that again. Uh, let's just see Bob. Okay. Uh, basically, the dimension. Okay. Okay. It's a video. It's a video. Don't you require a camera? Yeah. Adventures in Farm. Yeah. What a title. Yeah. Adventures in Farm. Great. Yeah. Adventures sure. in Farm. Great. Yeah. And it's camera. And uh, actually, we get a, a landscape for photo. Yep. So Can I see the photo? Okay, you haven't got the photo there. It doesn't have. What I'm going to do is create a stop motion animation with, to discuss about the deer, the one I saw at home. The home. Mm -hmm. So, to so discover what happened from me and what is going on, I see if they have sense of humor. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this has what they think of the things and make audience laugh. Mm -hmm. We talk humorous joke. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. Thanks for sharing. Oh, I should have said, like, the image, clearly this one. Um, thanks for sharing that. What was your name again? Oh, yes, I did. That's right. Ridwan, thank you, Ridwan. So Ridwan didn't have an image there. You clearly don't need to put an image. You do exactly what you want. I, I like a, this is something I post produced. When I did it originally, it was a just like handwritten sketch in my sketchbook, and I did like draw a carton of milk. It was just helpful to have a picture of a carton of milk. I was like, that's what I'm doing. I don't know, like uh, so. All I'm saying is like. If you, if, you, if you found this a useful thing to do, make sure you do it in a way that feels natural to you. I'm just saying this is the way I do it, and I, I like to have a picture there, but you can, you can kind of like, you know. Um, mm, mm, yeah, yeah. You can put a funny picture. You can find something from like Google or something. You, something that might, I don't know, like make it, a, make it a thing that consolidates, crystallizes, I find like, trying to do creative work can be like overwhelming you no know? there's just now in our lives there's a lot and how do we like contain that stuff and a, 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 a picture I'm speaking of a thousand words like it can kind of like give you something just like to go okay that so that is anyway that's all anyone else want to share what they come up with they yeah. do We've got lots of other things to do, so it's all right. I don't need to torture anyone. Um, all right, so I'm going to talk a bit more about briefs now. Briefs. So the creative briefs. So I worked in advertising. When I left university, uh, I was like super confused. I did like linguistics, and that's not immediately very useful for anything, really. And I got a job in advertising, and I went out to the States, and I wrote Coke ads and Heineken and stuff like that. So I had this kind of amazing immersion in um, the world of consumer capitalism. And I became like entrenched in this world that is like brief based. You know, you have the client who want to sell more Coca Cola, you have the account person. So, so that's the client. Screens two and three. Uh, this is the advertising agency, so I don't know if you know this, but you have the account people, the strategy people, and the creative people. So here you have Coca-Cola, and here you might, and here you have all the the ad folk. The account person is a sort of like they talk to the client, business need, creative solution. How do you get from the business lead selling lots of Coke to the creative solution? I don't know. Um, kid on a skateboard drinking coke. How do you get from there to there? You, um, you have a series of like relationships. The client and the account person talk about the business needs and the sort of all that. The strategy person looks at sort of research, looks at uh, what's going on, what's the zeitgeist at the moment, looks at data, looks at who's drinking coke um, and why and how it's changing and what are the threats and does focus groups you know like organizers like group of 10 people and they talk about what coke means to them or, or you know they sort of elicit research 
and then they translate that to the creatives through the brief. Now, you possibly know all this, but, you know, different ad agencies have different creative briefs. And this is, I'm telling you this, because this is sort of how I think I got to writing myself little briefs, because it was sort of quite a useful document that in advertising, that sort of these biblical sort of things where you have like a, like an A4 page with, this is what we're trying to do, you know, what's the opportunity? What do we want people to do? Who are we talking to? What's the response we want from the advertising? You know, you have these kind of like set questions. Each ad agency, J. Walter Thompson, like they have their own sort of like former brief. This is their brief from the 70s, so it's definitely changed since then. But it's like the brief is still like a one page kind of, kind of, kind of document like that, that, that sort of organizes like what's the sort of business requirement? How are we going to kind of contain like all the possibilities to give these creative thinkers. I mean, the strat basically, the strategy person here comes up with this one page brief and gives it to the creatives and that's meant to inspire them to come up with some, some answer that we see on our TV screens and on the, on the billboards. So, you know, Ogilvy and Maida, they've got a slightly different variation on the brief, like, you know, who are we talking to and what relevant things are going on in their lives? Uh, you know, what's our key proposition? The key proposition, the, the proposition is like the sort of thought, the single thought, like, um, like baked beans, you know, proposition for baked beans would be like protein without the murder, you know, for example, like, it's like a way of simplifying, like lots of complex stuff in just like a thought. I like to work a bit like that in a way that's just like, try to sort of think about all of the complexities of the Middle East, and then I'll think, and then I'll try and melt it down to something that's like, put a carton of milk in an Israeli supermarket. You know, it's like a, it's like a simple sort of like, but that's a, that's an action. Obviously, such and suchy, they've got a slightly different th proposition. The slow beer. You know, it's like a, it's just a sort of bullet little idea that can, that might be all the, the creatives, who most of the time aren't really concentrating that hard or sort of like, not really that business minded or something. If you tell them, okay, the slow beer. And they'll go, like, oh, okay. Um, because, you know, as we know, like, this is a very rational document, but like, going back to the beginning, like, rational stuff doesn't necessarily like, help. So how do we like, move between very rational spaces? This is what I want to do. This is what you know, my employers told me to do. And then this is more like what I sort of, I'm interested in and what I feel like. This is what makes me love. And I think like, so much of creative work is about that negotiating between the very rational and then the more like, well, I don't know, and it comes pop, plopping out of your amygdala and it's like, you know, that's funny and I'm not sure why. And I think that that sort of dance is the thing that, that a brief, in a sense, for me, can contain. So you have the rules of the game and then you kind of explore all the possibilities inside of it. I don't know, Reebok. Brand voice, compassionate and understanding. Insight, most men like to be in shape but don't have time because of work and family life. You know the feeling. Anyways, today, uh, um, words coming back to mouth. <laughs> DNA D New Blood Awards. Are you familiar with, with, with that? I should imagine some of you might be. Um, Pauline said you were. Uh, so, DNA D is a design and art. Directors Association are a kind of industry body who do all kinds of things. They have an awards ceremony where they tell people how brilliant, like they select the best visual communication and non-visual, but largely in sort of commercial spaces. Um, so they have awards, they have new blood, which is like a um, fairly vampiric term to describe like a training academy for people like who are emerging, coming up, maybe at your stage or something. And every year they publish briefs, the New Blood Awards, and, and you can respond to them for these, like a set of real world briefs that real clients give them and then anyone can respond to them, upload them, here are the dates, how to enter, the tutors get a pack, you know, and then you can maybe, it's a good way of getting sort of maybe recognized if that's the world you want to move into. Um, so, 
second half of today, this session, uh, what I'm going to do is make available to you guys on Google, my Google Drive, I've, I've sent a link out, so hopefully that will be floating around in Ether and available to you. I'll show you in a minute. Uh, is that the next slide? Not quite. There will be briefs. We will uh, do something with those. And I'm going to say what we're going to do with them. I like the fact that uh, DNAD has a strange sort of resonance with, with Dada, just because whatever. Dada, for me, is, uh, is very inspiring. Dada was a movement between, I think, 1913, 1926, uh, largely based in Zurich, um, mostly men. It was a um, mostly uh, some 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 of whom were expatriated. They were living in Switzerland because it was not it was neutral. Was not participating in the First World War. And it was, Dada was, if you don't know about it, it was a response to the madness of the world that they were living in. The world war um, mechanization of everything. The world was suddenly changing fast. And Dada was like a revolt, going back to a kind of revolt against reason, against the reason of, say, a kind of pseudo-modern European logic uh, that was clearly threatening um, humanity and like millions of people's lives were being lost. So Dada was basically an, an appeal to unreason, to the irrational, not by proposing this is our, this is our like, <laughs> this is our other set. They, they, sure, they had manifestos, but manifestos that didn't really make sense. If you have half an hour, go online and read the Dada manifesto, because I think it's still one of the most moving pieces of sort of like mm, it's it's like this kind of railing against reason through a sort of nonsense absurdity but there's language i mean like there's there's sense inside it it's just it's a bit like being in in your computer when the whole thing's kind of going into scrambled egg mode so dada was about like scrambling logic Fly, like clashing kind of cultural references, using the world as it was, and like, um, and sort of like throwing everything, you know, scrambling it up. This is Max Ernst, who said something like, a diver doesn't know what they're going to come back with when they go down there. Um, you know, you, you, uh, the point of that being like, you sort of set out on a kind of nonsense inquiry and maybe something will happen or maybe not. But, but if you go with a sense of like, well, just sort of one foot after the other into a space of reason, then you're only going to get to where you expected to go to. But Dada was like about like sort of imagining kind of, kind of possible emergent ideas through unreason, through sort of the irrational. Great, all great things happen through chance. He said something like that. So, so Dada was often like very much like, like collage based. And the reason that's in, like, interesting is because it wasn't like, like where I started out. It was like using what's in the world, you know, and then, and then re-collaging it, reappropriating it, like Duchamp's fountain, which is maybe the sort of advent of what we think of as contemporary art. It's like just sort of recontextualizing like a men's urinal and sticking it on a plinth at 90 degrees and suddenly like, hey presto, like all of the questions of value and what we assign meaning to, uh, not in one swoop, but in, in, in that period was sort of under revision. That's clearly, he, that was an industri industrially manufactured object, but he had sort of rearranged it and rearranged the context around it. I think he, but this is a total parenthesis, like footnote, so ignore if it's no value, but I recently discovered that it was, he didn't really, Duchamp wasn't really the, the originator of the um, of fountain. There was a woman whose name escapes me, but she was a baroness, a German woman in New York, who had, who had that in her apartment, uh, and she gave it to Duchamp. 
it's an interesting story. The Guardian wrote a piece about it. Um, so these histories keep on revealing themselves. Uh, this picture, uh, it, it, I think what I get from this, and that's Salvador Dali inevitably and a sort of icon of surrealism, but what, what's going on is like cats, chair, water, easel. But everything's suspended, and that's the point. Like, these are things we know, but they are suddenly in free fall. Nothing, nothing on the ground. Everything is open, like, like a poem. It's like a visual poem. Suddenly, the things that we know could take on totally new meanings, could be like rearranged, like a bucket of water, cats, everything is like... And I think that's, that's the point. That's the place where we can operate inside of the world as, we, as it is governed and given to us. But we can go, okay, but I am metaphorically going to explore what happens if all of those elements are momentarily thrown up in the air and I'm going to explore another way of them landing. So Dada were obsessed with like rule-based games. The most famous being the exquisite corpse, which is where you, I'm sure you know this, you fold a piece of paper like three or four times, different people draw different bits. This is actually the Chapman brothers uh, playing that game. And uh, you know, you might get just the neck, uh, but you, you haven't seen the head that your brother's drawn. And so then you, you draw this bit. And so then you, so it was a sort of way of deauthoring the image, like nobody could be the singular author but also kind of exploring like what happens when you allow chance and randomness and I don't know, accidents to, to sort of uh, uh, take place. But they also, um, they also played lots of language games. Um, and one of them was called the newspaper game, which is when they'd cut up newspaper articles uh, into all the individual words. And then they put them all in a bag shake them up and then they take the words out and then they'd reconstitute like an article that was clearly like sort of not the way the original article was but it was a different I mean it was using all the established words and imagining all of the infinitude of universes contained within that article like all of the, the possible realities and what I want to do is propose that we play that game with created briefs, with the briefs from DNAD. So to go back to Dada and DNAD, just sort of silly, simple idea. But um, I'll say what I mean. One link you should have been sent, you should have been sent two links. One is to this presentation that's on the screen right now, and the other one is to this folder, which has some new blood DNA D briefs. There's an assortment for you to choose from. Um, before you go into that, let me just e explain what we're going to do. So one of those briefs is for Facebook. Uh, I have my own stuff going on with Facebook, which I may or may not tell you about. So one of those briefs is Facebook. This is kind of what they look like. They've got like, what's the challenge? Who are we talking to? Things to think about. This is for workplace, which is their sort of online, like, kind of, what's that thing? Slack. It's a bit like Slack, but their, their version. And what I want you to do is to take, what's the challenge? Who are we talking to? Things to think about. What's the challenge? Who are we talking to? Things to think about. As you're, like, guiding, take those, leave them untouched, but then find words inside of all of that stuff, and rearrange them so that you can, and I like doing this pen and paper, like scissors and stuff, but clearly we don't have that long, it's messy. It, why it's nice doing it that way is because your brain is much less, you just sort of mm, throw words around, start to assemble them. If you do it with a computer and a mouse, you're more rational. However, today we're gonna do it that way. So look at, if you have Photoshop, hope you do, uh, if you don't, do pen and paper if you want. <clears throat> but what I would suggest is to use Photoshop, put that in, um, cut out what's the challenge, who are we talking to, things to think about, and then, and then, and then assign 
from within the, the document uh, your own challenge. Bring oceans to the workplace. Okay. Bring oceans to the workplace. So, right. Start to think about what... <laughs> Hmm. Really get get down with what that looks like. Why? What's what? What that? What that is? Who are we talking to? C plus level, dead bosses. Things to think about. A presentation for owls. Those are quite like specific things. I would encourage you to use nouns and verbs as much as possible, like things that you can touch or things that do things, not like adjectives. Briefs can be full of like airy adjectives. And what I would recommend, like like happy, sad, wonderful, extraordinary. What I would encourage you to do is, is, uh, is try, and, try and make, yeah, just take, take these three things, isolate words, give yourself a brief, and then let's see what, where we get to. Um, I'm gonna quickly, just to make, give you a bit of inspiration, show you three others. I did one for Amazon. The challenge, define and present a beautifully crafted farmer's breath. Beautifully crafted. So like that farmer's breath in the morning, you know, the misty. <sighs> Who's it for? Mouths tingling with one hour slots. Okay, so what we've got is a farmer's breath. It's like misty and it's morning. It's the dew. You can see all of that. And you've got like... Maybe it's just like a really thin farmer's breath. Mouths tingling with one hour slots. Who is it for? It's a bit like crossword puzzle, this. Who is it for? Mouths tingling. I think mouths tingling with one hour slots might, might be many things, but I think that could be a dentist surgery, right? So you go to the dentist for an hour, your mouth is operated on, it sort of tingles. So maybe it's about putting a farmer's breath, maybe a photograph of a farmer's breath, into a dentist surgery, right? So that if you're having your mouth tingling and you're being, you know, operated on, there's a, there's a, there's a framed photograph of that. The tap tap of gorgeous stock, what to consider, which might mean stock like stock market, might mean like fat stock dripping, dripping out of the uh, thing that you, you know, gargle when you finish, that could be dripping Stock, you know? You know what stock is, right? So there, <laughs> there's a little world there that is available, which wasn't there before, I don't think. I mean, people might have thought about that before, but I, I think <laughs> in the logic of the Amazon brief there, what this does is makes, uh, you know, not immediately useful to Amazon, but who knows, it's a new reality that like, has opened up. I'll show you one more so that you can uh, feel a bit. Burger King, what's the challenge? Take a tomato on a journey to the universe. Okay, who are we talking to? Free market people, skeptical of crisp lettuce. Think about the forgettable sea. So, I was thinking about this one on the way. Take a tomato on a journey to the universe. Universe obviously doesn't have an E on the end. Universe is a, is a, is a typeface without the E on the end. But, but I live in Mile End, not very far away, and I was thinking about university, uh, Queen Mary's. I was thinking like, you could take a tomato, just like on a little journey from my house to, uh, to Queen Mary's like this. And then um, maybe I could make a video of that, right? and then present that to, well, it's not far to Canary Wharf, um, right? So free market people, and then skeptical of Chris Lattis. That could be, maybe I'll go to Canary Wharf with a video of, of that, and go to somewhere like a fast food joint where it's just clearly not a Chris Lattis sort of place. So that might be the audience that we're meant to be Things that we, the forgettable sea, well, an easy answer to that would be maybe the audio of the video is like the sound of, well, it could be the Aral Sea, which has dried up largely, thanks to the fashion industry. The forgettable sea, I'm not sure, that, that's like, but that maybe the soundtrack of wind. 
So anyway, there you go. I hope that's clear. I mean, it's crystal clear, isn't it? Um, uh, do you have the link for the briefs? Thank you. Um, so we go underneath those uh, headings and we cut out the words from, from underneath the sentences. Exactly. So if you go if you go to this folder, find don't spend very long. Just don't read them all, just go, oh, BBC, I'll go with that one, ASOS, whatever. Pick, pick a brief, because in the end, like... And in that brief, what's the challenge? Here we... So find a bit where it's like, what's... Oh, hello. What's the challenge? Hey, oh, hello. Sorry. Maybe cut out the logo, the workplace bit. Cut out what's the challenge, who we're talking to, things to think about. Maybe start with a document, A4, that just looks like that, okay? You've got your titles. And then start to, like, I don't know, cut out words, like, um, it works, it works around. Or maybe, uh, I don't know, think about, uh, uh, where would I start with this one? Create an integrated. You know, what's the challenge? Create an integrated, and then look for another word. Hmm. Hmm. Hello? What? I'm, I'm talking to you. I'm looking at the screen, but I'm talking to you. I know. Uh, create an integrated global workforce. I don't know. I'm stuck. Or... Uh, I'm trying to do it live here. Or oh, show how, that's quite nice. Show how. So what's the challenge? You know, give yourself a, an, an action, like a, an imperative, something, a doing thing. Um, oh, and thank you. And, and once you've... Um, once you've done this, what I want you to do is put your, your brief on the end of this presentation. So, thanks for saying that. So here, so at the bottom of the presentation, you should have got two links, one to the briefs and one to this presentation. You don't have it? No, you, you hit the presentation. Oh, okay. There you go. Uh, and then you go to the bottom. Uh, so, all right. So, if you click on the link that's for the presentation, and then you scroll to the bottom. There you go. If you scroll to the bottom, then you see the slides on the left-hand side. And then you just copy and paste and add a new slide and write, you know, my brief. So you can drop your brief as a JPEG onto this presentation, and then we'll have a look at them. Does that make sense? Any questions? Does that make sense to you? Do you know what? Do you feel like you know what's going on? You, you, if you pick a brief, uh, no, yeah, I mean, the brief, and then we can take, take words from any part of that brief. 
Exactly. So, All right, so I'll just say it one more time in case no one any doubts, and definitely ask if you're not sure. Because it's clearly this is all a bit sort of wonk, weird and wonky. I don't expect this to be totally crystal clear first time. There's a folder for the briefs. Pick a brief at random, whichever one. There we go. Facebook Workplace. Go on Photoshop and Start to, make a, start to make your own brief from this brief. So cut out the logo, maybe at the top, so you know who you're doing it for. Cut out what's the challenge, who we're talking to, and things to think about, right? So you're going to answer those questions. But then you're just going to select words randomly, like move around the brief, find, find things that you can like reconstitute a new sentence from, you know? Um, So that's what I made from the Facebook one. Bring oceans to the workplace. You can do it in Word. You can do any program you want. Um, and once you've done it, once you've done it, go on this presentation and make a slide at the end, your own slide, and just drag and drop your JPEG onto that. Um, does anyone need any help, questions, or anything? Are you OK? I oh, find okay, cool. And if you'd rather, you don't have to do it on Photoshop. You can just handwrite it if you'd rather, but you know that's up to you. The nice thing about photoshopping is that then it's more like a collage, like visually as well. Any length. It can be. It can be any length you like, um, but you don't need to make them long sentences. Sometimes it's quite nice to make them short so that it's, it's sort of clearer and simpler, you know? Anyone else need um, any support? Are you all right? Yeah, I might need to get added to the group. Oh, you're not in the group. Yes. I have no idea. I don't want to have to do it. For example, how do I do? How do I take this slide? Oh, it's. It's not um, the other. Go back to the email where you saw this, because it's not that. So briefs go there, and then you just open any of those briefs. You just choose one of those. Right. All right. I put it in Photoshop. Exactly. And then you do. Who are we talking to? Teams is quite Yeah. <laughs> Everything. As soon as you look at it. Are you happy? Is that meant now? More or less? Okay. Yeah, have a go. Have a go. And, um, you know, there's no. Clearly, no right or wrong answers. I hope that is uh, clear now. Do you think we're okay? I'm going to have a quick pee. <laughs> yeah.
a problem. I, I should underline the fact that, like, I didn't do these in five minutes. These took me, like, you know, half an hour or something. Like, you know, we're speeding this one because it's a workshop and stuff. So I'm not saying, just because they're short, it doesn't mean it should be, like, you know, it takes a beautifully crafted farmer's breath. It doesn't just come out of nowhere, you know? <laughs> um, the woman that just came, can I include her? Because she, has she gone? She just picked up a phone call. Well, when she comes back, because it'd be nice if she doesn't feel like left yeah, out. I know. Cool. So what, the way I approached this was like the challenge, I made it like an action, like do this thing, like do something. And who is it for? Clearly, I was thinking about find like it might be something that might be people or animals or a being or some body part or something. So that's an action. And that's a, a sort of a person, thing, subject. You can do the action to. What to consider? That might just be something like, just like really, something that just mm, throws a curveball in, something like an image of something. Let me show you another one. And I won't show you anyone you're thinking. What's the time? First. So, do you have that email? Do you know what? Can you send me that and then I'll put it on the screen? Can you send me that email? Or actually, hold on a minute. No, wait a minute. I can, I've got that email on my. Don't me. I'm being stupid. Don't worry. Okay. It's all right. I can do this. So, guys, uh, if you've got. Uh, an email looking like this, something like that, anyway, presentation and briefs. Once you've done your Photoshop-y brief thing, go to that email, click the first link, presentation. That will open this, the presentation I've been showing you. And I want you to scroll to the bottom of that. All right. And look, someone's... Someone's done a brilliantly added theirs. So just copy and paste or go to insert. How do you do insert slide? New slide. Insert new slide. So control M. There you go. And you'll make a new slide. OK? Or if you do, it's on your phone, if it's on your phone. He did this one. Yeah? Love it. The, um, the strength of jogging the channel is, it's really, um, what does that make you feel? Like, how do you, tell me where this takes your brain. Yeah. Some, some authority bigger than the judges was trying to harness. Yeah. So I've actually made something quite sinister, predatory. Yeah. 
Yes, I totally spot on. I couldn't agree more. And it's funny, it's like right now with refugee crisis being all over the news, I mean, clearly our brains will all go to different places with this, but I'm like, my goodness, you know, the channel is like, just lights up all those thoughts for me. And then the judges and Pretty Patel and the rebellious tribe and they're kind of bigger than the Pretty Patels and like Doc Martens, I mean, that all feels pretty punk, you know, that feels like, like 1970s London kind of anarchy in the UK. It's like, the fun, I don't know, that what, I'm, what I'm saying is what I see in this is immediately like, I mean, it's, it's wonky and strange, but it takes you suddenly to somewhere that could be, it's not this, you know, if you'd read their brief and gone down that, you'd have gone the way that they were telling you to go, but you know what I'm saying? And so I, I, I find, um, I think you've done a, I mean, it's not every, it's not every brief that'll do that, but this, I think you've done a great job because it's really clear. You also, it's nice because you've like, you know, you don't have to obey linguistic constraints. You don't have to have all the prepositions in the right place. You just like, it's about creating an image. And, and I think what I find really successful about this is it's short, you know, they're all, you just, um, what would you, what would you, if you, if I was like, all right, what's your name? Dominic. Dominic. If I was like, Dominic, you've got to leave this room and go and make something by 6.30 tonight. What do you think you'd do? Because the judges, how are you going to basically, the, who it's for isn't just like, well, those are the people it's for. That's the media question. That's the choice of medium. That's like, what are you going to, you know, decide who the judges are, but then, I don't know if you were thinking, well, people at the Old Bailey, then how are you going to show them at the Old Bailey whatever you're doing? So it's kind of, there's a, there are two questions in who it's for. Right now, the you have right now, the authority 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 you have right now, the the English channel, but then of course it could be like a channel on the screen, or it can just be, uh, well actually that's a channel, isn't it, you know? Um, and so, so looking at our assumptions in, in words, and if it's like, oh shit, I can't be asked to go down to Dover, that's okay, because then you can like say, well it's not that kind of channel, you know? Um, or you can basically, I mean words contain infinitude of meanings, so. All right, I'm going to give you one more minute, and then we're going to, uh, yeah? Don't worry if you haven't, you know, this is more about sharing and sharing and caring. All right, guys, even if you haven't finished, that's okay. Like, you can finish it later, but I think for now, it would be nice if you put your pens down and um, so that we can collectively look at what people have made and have a look. Say again? 
You finished? Great, which one's yours? Or oh, let's talk about this one. Who made this one? Great. So, shall I read it? Because I've got a noisy voice. What's the challenge? Frame grilling on the right track. Who are you talking to? Especially cool, cynical hero, the, woof, the woofer. <laughs> Who's it for? The home and expert, big, splashy, self-deprecating meme. <laughs> big, splashy, self-deprecating meme. All right, brilliant. Especially cool, cynical, hero, the offer. <laughs> it's good. I like your, like, you've got these adjectives squashed together. Um, cool, cynical, hero. Oh, good. Good. <laughs> well, I think, you know, because you can't, I mean, I, Pauline said to me that you do get briefs here, like, as part of your unit. So, I mean, I don't know what your tutors would say, but have a go with those. When I get briefs, or when I got briefs, I mean, I still freelance, and often the brief's like, oh, the brief. But actually, the brief is your friend, because it's the limits. And if you don't have a limit, then you're like, oh, you're, that's worse. You're like, I don't know what my homework is. So my point, really, with the whole thing today is, like, how do you, how do you personalize the structures that you kind of are forced or brought into? The things that pertain you, how can you make them your own? So how can you take a brief that you're given and reshuffle it into a point that you feel, I mean, and also the other things, even if you don't do this, briefs are briefs. Like, we cannot read the brief enough times. And because they're kind of like boring and it sounds like the voice of authority, often it's like, ugh. But the trouble is that when I've done that in the past, like I've read the brief for like once or twice and I'm like, ugh. You go off and do hours and weeks of work and then you come back, it's like, you know, they didn't answer the question. So, I think this exercise, like, it's about looking really closely at the words on the right track. Like, on the right track sort of clearly means, like, you're getting it right. But there are other ways of interpreting that, right? There could be the right track and the left track. So you go down to Clapham Junction, and, and then you, you, know, you start flame grilling your burgers. But you might be on the right track. But if you're on the other side going the other way, this is the right track. So then you'd be opening up a conundrum, right? So cool, cynical hero, the whopper. So possibly that you're down there grilling your uh, quarter pounder, and there's a cool, cynical hero who's like giving you jit from the from the platform. So that's the person. That's your audience. That's who you're talking to. Who's it for? Home and expert, big, splashy, self-deprecating meme. We got to, we'll go have longer to unpack that one. <laughs> but any ideas? You're on the track. Yes. Yeah, oh, I see. So maybe you're frame grilling. You're doing the frame grill, and you're talking to the person on the track who's not being very nice to you. But from that, you make a meme out of that conversation. Big and flashy and self-deprecating. I mean, it's quite self-deprecating to be grilling with the potential threat of obliteration at any moment. Maybe a bit more than self-deprecating. All right. Fragmented Radio Soul. What was the uh, company this was for? His? Doc Martens. Brilliant. Do you mind if I read it out loud? Fragmented Radio Soul, the challenge, harness innovative calls to action. What's essential? Hugely sensitive experiment with mandatory champions. A hugely sensitive experiment. That definitely, that feels like a hugely sensitive ex That's like, yeah, I, I'm getting a, a strong feeling for that. Genuinely playful self. What to consider? Submit expressiveness. 
that's nice. That's quite a lot of improvisational dance performance, maybe. What would you think? Submit expressiveness. How does where does that take you? Yeah. Current campaign dies. That's nice. That's good. That's what a good marketing or oh, that's not what a good mark. That's what like male marketing executives come in. This is, happens a lot in advertising. They're like, all right, none of that's working. Let's, let's, we're going to do this. And so regularly you have a really quite good brand, which is just sabotaged by current campaign dies. But maybe in the case of Doc Martens, you know, they need, um, they need new innovative calls to action. Hold on a minute. Uh, this one went up first, so I'm going to go to that one. Hasbro, challenge, your mission is to find a shearhead. Was that real? Who's is this? Was that really in the brief? Excellent. Who? Adults looking for fun. Consider drinking someone else's blood. I mean... What I like about your brief is I know what I have to do. I don't really want to do it, but I know it's very clear. So I'm like, okay. Find a sheer head. So um, what, what, if I, what's your name? Camilla, if, if you had with a gun to your head to deliver on this brief this evening, have you got any ideas what you what you might do, because I'm not going to do it, but I'm going to. That's good. What do Hasbro do? Oh, it's a toy manufacturer. So what about some like fake vampire teeth, you know? With like, well, and then you could, I mean, it only says consider drinking someone else's blood, so you, problematic during a pandemic. I went past big and scary tough nut. <laughs> Who's with this one? Brilliant. Fine. Big and scary tough nut, that just, that's fully legit. The proud and passionate, lifelong fans of the spirit of rebellious self-expression. Whoever they are, they sound like people I want to be with. Big and scary, tough nut. Yeah. What was the, what was the brand that was for? Okay. Uh-huh. Because, I mean, Don Martins and Burger King. I can see sculpturally how they could work quite nicely together, you know, like uh, like bother boots, right? Steel toe caps, but maybe they're filled with like mushy ketchup and beef and <laughs> you know what I mean? And there's someone like walking around just like ketchup. Mm. But like, I mean, if you, you know, if you bring this back to the brands you're working on, there is something in there if you force your brain. Uh, look, I'm not sure how many of you have spent time in corporate environments, but the language in there can be sort of like, you know, it's not that different oftentimes to sort of, because, but everyone's nodding and grinning and saying, you know, big and scary tough nuts and, you know, and so, like, as we know, language is just arbitrary noises that we bark at one another. Um, but if everyone's making the same noises, then it makes sense. And so, like, my challenge to you is, is to look at this as like, okay, it's stupid, but then to leave that and to go, okay, what is, like, if you really actually acknowledge that there's a reality, there's a poetic truth, what Werner Herzog calls the ecstatic truth. And what he means, do you know Werner Herzog? Well, look up Werner Herzog. He's the guy that made Fitzcarraldo. I mean, so many amazing films. The Wrath of God. Can you get them to watch some Werner Herzog? I mean, I mean, really, like the most. He will, he will expand your mind. And he talks about ecstatic truth. 
And what he means by that is he says, you have the accountant's truth. And that is the, that is the truth of like, you know, just the truth of like, that's a TV. But like, then the ecstatic truth is, you know, that is a surface for like, or, or rather the ecstatic truth is he will make up some extraordinary fiction about this object, which floated down the Amazon, you know, and was cradled like, like, like a sort of messianic offering, you know, and he'll, he'll sort of produce, and in his documentaries, they're sort of so-called documentaries, but then he'll just introduce this kind of like fictive bogus stuff. But by that point, it doesn't really matter. And you don't even know what's the truth and what's the fiction. And we're in a world of disinformation, so it's sort of relevant. But the point, the point is that he's saying, like, the accountant's truth is this sort of, like, you know, we all get it. But then there's the poetic truth that he says accesses real human unconscious emotional truth. There's that truth that actually is much more real than what we call reality, because it goes into a place that we go, oh, I actually feel something that I've never thought before. And I think art, design, fashion, whatever you end up working in, that's like the kind of space that is available. And we've all got it inside us. And we all have to work our lives into structures, professional and, but we, we just mustn't sacrifice those like leaves in the wind, those weird poetic bits of ourselves. Or sacrifice finding shitheads. Dr. Martins, what's the challenge? Harness genuine champions. <laughs> a lot of harnessing going on. <laughs> they were like, <laughs> who are we talking to? Uh, hugely sensitive millennials. Hey, don't call them snowflakes. Who's is this? Hugely sensitive millennials. Things to think about. Non-conformist subcultures. Brilliant. Hugely sensitive millennials. Genuine champions. Unconformists. I like the fact that you've got this, linguistically, you've created like a very clear set of instructions. Like, right? It's good that. That, don't lose that. Um, hugely sensitive millennials. I love the idea of Doc Martin's wearers and they're like, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. With harnesses, with harnesses on, exactly. Very nice. Very nice. I think of Doc Martin's being this, I mean, it is a sort of 70s image of, of sort of punk and like, who gives a shit? And like maybe in 2021, like, you know. Now they're back, exactly. Yeah, yeah. The challenge, Hasbro, create card games, marbles, on the playground charades. Card, card games, marbles. Who's is this one? Hi. Card games, marbles, that's nice. So maybe, would those be glass marbles with cards inside them? Like a playing card, but maybe you could make it into a marble, you know? That would be quite a nice way of playing card games. On the playground chara charades, charades. Who's it for? 16-year-old men. Simple. What to consider? Obvious starting point for innovation. Well, there's an obvious starting point there. What do you think the obvious starting point is? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now it looks good, yours as well. I like the um. Mm. Although, he's chopped off the bottom of the P here, so it's more like expect the unexpected. 
which is less expected than the, the unexpected, maybe. <laughs> expected the unexpected, yes. That's really nice. There's also a little I there as well. What's the time? Eight minutes. Amazon, the challenge. Whose is this? What's your name? Eustace. Uh, the challenge. Amazon Fresh. That's the food one, isn't it? Fire slots. Available seven days a week. Fire slots. A fire slot. What do you think a fire slot is? Seven days a week, though. Um, fire slots. Is that more like, is that like artillery fire or more? No. Yeah. Fire slot. Fire slot. I see. That's it. Fire slots. You just say it confidently. What's your name? Valerie. Valerie's just like, look, it's fire slots, okay? We said it. So that's the point. Black Friday, seven days a week. Don't know the treats are Britain's best. So you know, fire, fire slot days, you don't know that treats are Britain's best. Oh, uh, on the fire slot days. What is a British treat? Where are you from, Eustace? Lithuania. So you're probably quite, you come and you see Britain, you can observe Britain's treats better than maybe I can. What do you think our treats are? <laughs> you don't know any British treats? Well, we should... Well, we, should, we haven't treated you well enough. I'm afraid, take that to your tutors, because if you hadn't had British treats. <laughs> Maybe like, do you know what a, a custard cream is, or a jammy dodger? Uh, I like those. A custard cream. Yeah, the design on the custard cream is straight out of Victorian uh, steel. Well, I like that. Okay, so let's say custard creams are Britain's best. So, as Valerie was saying, uh, fire slots, but the fire slots, what was it? So, fire slots are like Black Friday, like the discount moments, you know, like you want to have the sun and then all of a sudden you're on Amazon Fresh, you consume, you're trying to buy stuff, and then all of a sudden it goes, Whoa! Yes. For five minutes, and you, all you can do treats. Uh, post Brexit, Britain's best. Yeah. Okay. What she said. I, who's it for? Identity or persona? I like that. That's nice. That's quite Freudian. That makes me think like it's a part of your anyone's like superego id or somewhere. What What is that? What do you see in the identity? Um, who it's for? Well, basically, AR. AR. AI or AR? AI. 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 Yeah. So it's for an AI, all of this. Yeah. Well, it's really nice that because, you know, increasingly, language, visual and verbal language, isn't really for humans anymore, anyway, is it? So you can feed this into a machine and some AI, and they'll be like, oh, yeah, that thing, fire slots and custard creams. No problem. We'll have that one month. When you go at the checkout, you know you go at the checkout on Amazon. Yeah. You don't see identity. You see the name of the shop. Yeah. 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 What's the name of the other one? Paypal. Paypal. So instead of those, you can actually check out with your identity mm. or personal. Mm. An identity is a type of payment. Ah, I see. With your finger. I'm going to pay with identity. Yep. And then personal face recognition. 
Yeah. Oh, no, I just bought 40,000 fire slots. <laughs> They'll all be delivered in the morning. Evacuate. Oh, look, have we got to the end? Oh, no, wait, there's one more. The Nike one. Nike, what's the challenge? Showing human potential. Who are we talking to? Social media obsessed sneaker audience. Things to think about. Inclusivity and support for elite athletes. Well, that feels like the kind of thing they would love you to. Uh, Dana Stevens, showing human potential. I think, I think basically you've taken a brief and you've made it, taken out a lot of the unnecessary words, I'm sure. So that's, that's a good thing to do as well. Um, I hope today's been useful, uh, or at least fun. And I don't know, all I would say is this is something that I, not this, but writing briefs and thinking about framing what the hell we're trying to do. It's taken me quite a long time in my life to figure out that actually I don't need to do much. We don't need to do very much. We just need to do sort of the right stuff. And by right, I just mean like spend a bit more time thinking about what it is that I'm trying to do. Don't just like go off and just like hope to find it. So the point of a brief is you give yourself like a little space and then you work inside that thing and then you can be completely free and just like open your mind and be expansive and not know what you're doing. But if you do that inside something that is quite carefully defined, you feel a lot happier and freer actually than if you just have like infinite possibilities, which I just find like, <coughs> so that was really the point I was trying to get across.